Hello, I'm Jeremy Fogel. I've been a United States District Judge since 1998, and I am now the Director of the Federal Judicial Center. As you probably know by now, this is a patent case. So you may be wondering, how can I sit in judgment on a case like this when I'm not entirely sure what a patent is? We hope to answer that concern with this brief video, which will give you some of the background needed to do your job. This case will involve some special issues that the judge and lawyers will explain to you, but all patent cases involve some basics that you will learn about. This video will discuss what patents are, why we have them, how people get them, and why there are disputes that require us to call in a jury like you. We'll also show you what patents look like. The United States Constitution gives Congress the power to pass laws relating to patents. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 allows Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. A patent, then, is an official grant by the United States government that gives its owner certain rights to an invention. Those include the right to stop others from making, using, selling, or offering for sale the invention that is claimed in the patent. A patent lasts for a specific period of time, usually 20 years from the date that the application is filed by the inventor. But because it takes an average of three years for the Patent and Trademark Office to act on the application, the effective life of the patent is closer to 17 years. A patent represents a bargain made between the government and the inventor. In return for the right to prevent others from using the invention, the inventor must enhance the public knowledge, or what we sometimes call the state of the art, by adding something new and useful to it. A famous example is Thomas Edison's invention of the light bulb. Harnessing electrical power for illumination transformed society and led to many other important breakthroughs. During the lifetime of the patent, its disclosure may inspire new inventions, and after it expires, the invention is free for anyone to use. It is this combination of something new and valuable to the public that justifies granting time-limited patent protection to the inventor. A patent is in many ways like a deed to a piece of property. It grants the owner the right to keep people off the property or to charge them a fee, like rent, for using it. And just as a deed indicates boundaries defining the landowner's property, a patent claim defines the patentee's domain. The patent system works because the inventor is required to describe the invention in clear and specific terms so that the public knows what the boundaries of the invention are. Once a patent is issued by the government, it becomes available for public inspection. In that way, anyone who learns of the patent can read it and understand exactly what the inventor invented and the limits of the patent set forth in the claims. Now that we understand what a patent is, let's take a closer look at the term invention. An invention is a new way of solving a problem or a useful new machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter. The patent process begins in the mind of the inventor, and in particular when the invention is formulated in the mind of the inventor. Patent lawyers call this conception. This is when the idea occurs to the inventor clearly enough that he or she can write it down and explain it to someone. To qualify for a patent, the invention needs to be new and useful. Also, it must not be obvious to one of ordinary skill in the field. If the inventor believes these requirements are met, he or she will prepare an application for filing with the Patent and Trademark Office, whose headquarters are in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. The Patent and Trademark Office, often called the PTO, is the agency of the federal government whose job it is to examine patent applications to make sure they are in proper form and comply with the requirements of the law. The inventor can prepare an application for filing with the PTO, but usually it is drafted by a patent attorney or a patent agent who specializes in what is called prosecuting patent applications, that is, the process by which they are evaluated. The attorney or agent works with the inventor to be sure the invention is described and claimed in a way that complies with the law and the regulations of the PTO. 
98% of patent applications are made online using the PTO's electronic filing system, although a few paper applications are still made. When the PTO receives the inventor's application, it is first checked to see if it is complete and complies with all the PTO's application requirements. It then assigns the submission to a patent examiner, a staff person with a background in the field or art the invention falls within, to evaluate the application and decide whether a patent can be granted. You've been given a sample patent to refer to as you watch this video, so you already have a sense of what a patent looks like. But now let's take a closer look at the three main parts of a patent. To begin with, there is some basic identifying information on the first page. This material is highlighted in your handout. On the upper right side of the page is the number assigned to the patent by the PTO. And on the left side is a title that describes the invention and the names of the inventors and sometimes the company to whom they've assigned the patent. Also on the left is the date when the patent application was filed and back on the right, the date when the patent was issued. There also is more detailed information on the first page, including a list of numbers following the caption, Field of Search. These numbers identify previously issued patents the examiner looked at or searched to make sure the applicant's claimed invention really is something new, not obvious, and thus patentable. Also listed on the first page are what we call references, that is, previous patents or articles that describe the technology or prior art known at the time the application was filed. It may seem strange to you that we call this pre-existing technology prior art, even though it has nothing to do with artists. We use the word art in its historical sense to include inventions and other subject matter reasonably related to the claimed invention. We also refer to the latest technology as state of the art, and we say of someone who can understand and apply the technology that he or she is skilled in the art. The second major part of the patent is what we call the specification or written description. As is the case in your sample, it is usually the longest part of the patent. It includes an abstract, which is a brief summary of the invention, a background section that describes the nature of the problem the invention is supposed to solve, one or more drawings called figures, that illustrate various aspects of the application, and a detailed description of one or more embodiments of the invention. An embodiment is a specific device or method that uses the invention, such as a particular form of light bulb. The third and most important part of the patent is the claims. These are the numbered paragraphs that appear at the end. The claims are what give the public notice of the boundaries of the invention. They are similar to the description of property you may have seen in a deed, referring to precise measurements taken on the ground. The judge will instruct you further on how any technical or ambiguous terms in the patent claims should be understood. Now that we've discussed the main parts of a patent, let's look at how the PTO processes patent applications, what we referred to earlier as prosecution of the patent application. This process begins when the inventor's application arrives at the PTO. There, it receives a filing date. Under the America Invents Act of 2011, filing dates will determine who is awarded the patent if there are competing valid applications. In 2012, the PTO received nearly 600,000 patent applications and issued more than 270,000 patents. After determining that the application is complete, the receiving branch also decides what field of technology an application relates to and assigns it to the appropriate examining group. In order to make that decision, the patent examiner usually looks at patents that have been issued previously in the same or closely related fields of art. The examiner has computer databases that contain information used to accomplish this task. Another part of the job is to decide if the inventor's description of the invention is complete and clear enough to meet the requirements for a patent, including the requirement that the description enables someone of ordinary skill in the field to actually make and use it. However, because the job of examining so many applications is challenging, the law requires the applicant to tell the examiner whatever he or she knows about the prior art 
that might be important to the examiner's decision on whether to allow the patent. We call this the applicant's duty of candor. One way the applicant can satisfy this duty is by bringing pertinent prior art to the attention of the examiner, either in the original application or in other submissions called information disclosure statements. In this way, the decisions of the examiner are based on both the information provided by the applicant and on the information the examiner finds during his or her prior art search. Sometimes the examiner concludes that the application meets all the requirements we've discussed and allows the patent to issue at this first stage. But more frequently, the examiner will reject the application as deficient in some respect. This decision will be communicated by the examiner in what is called an office action, which is a preliminary notice to the applicant of what the examiner finds insufficient or unpatentable. For example, the examiner may reject certain claims as being unpatentable because a journal article written and published by another person prior to the effective filing date of the patent application disclosed what the applicant was currently claiming. At that point, the applicant prepares a written response either agreeing or disagreeing with the examiner. An applicant who agrees with the examiner can suggest amendments to the application designed to overcome the examiner's rejection. Alternatively, an applicant who disagrees with the examiner's office action can explain the reasons for the disagreement. This exchange of office actions and responses goes on until the examiner issues a final office action, which may reject or allow some or all of the applicant's claims. The overall process is referred to as the prosecution history of the application. The written incoming and outgoing correspondence between the PTO examiner and the applicant is also called the file wrapper. In the past, these file wrappers were all in paper form, as were the submitted applications. Now they are most often electronic and may occasionally be paper as well. Most patent applications filed on or after November 29, 2000 are published by the PTO 18 months after the inventor has filed his or her application so that the public may inspect it. Once a final PTO office action has occurred and one or more claims have been allowed, the applicant is required to pay an issuance fee and the patent is printed. Then on the date shown on the upper right hand corner of the first page of the patent, it is issued by the PTO and the inventor receives all the rights of a patent. That date is highlighted on your sample. Once a patent has issued, the inventor or the person or company the inventor has assigned a patent to can enforce the patent against anyone who uses the invention without permission. We call such unlawful use infringement. But the PTO and its examiners have no jurisdiction over questions relating to infringement of patents. If there is a dispute about infringement, it is brought to the court to decide. Sometimes in a court case, you are also asked to decide about validity that is, whether the patent should have been allowed at all by the PTO. A party accused of infringement is entitled to challenge whether the asserted patent claims are sufficiently new or non-obvious in light of the prior art, or whether other requirements of patentability have been met. In other words, a defense to an infringement lawsuit is that the patent in question is invalid. You may wonder why it is that you would be asked to consider such things when the patent has already been reviewed by a government examiner. There are several reasons for this. First, there may be facts or arguments that the examiner did not consider, such as prior art that was not located by the PTO or provided by the applicant. In addition, there is of course the possibility that mistakes were made or important information overlooked. Examiners have a lot of work to do and no process is perfect. Also, unlike a court proceeding, prosecution of a patent application takes place without input from people who might later be accused of infringement. So it is important that we provide a chance for someone who is accused of infringement to challenge the patent in court. In deciding issues of infringement and validity, it is your job to decide the facts of the case. The judge will instruct you about the law, which may include the meaning of certain words or phrases contained in the patent. So it is your primary duty as jurors to resolve any factual disputes and in some cases, such as infringement and validity, to apply the law to those facts. To prove infringement, the patent holder must persuade you by what is called a preponderance of the evidence relating to the facts of the case that the patent has been infringed. 
To prove invalidity, the alleged infringer must persuade you by what is called clear and convincing evidence that the patent is invalid. The judge in your case will explain these and other terms and provide additional specific instructions at the appropriate time. Good luck with your task and thank you for your service.